uh, when we began the study uh, in 1976, we were based in Puget Sound, actually, uh, right across from Seattle and Bainbridge Island. And uh, we had a sighting system. People would report whales that they had seen. Actually, we inherited the sighting system that the people that captured whales had used. A lot of the people that lived on the waterfront uh, reported to Don Goldsberry, the captor, uh, where whales were, and he'd go try and catch them. Uh, so we just sort of incorporated his uh, sighting system and built more of our own, and we would respond to sightings in a boat and try and uh, find the whales that were sighted and photograph them. Uh, as I say, we're using the techniques that Dr. Mike Big had developed, um, and we had started in Puget Sound, in 1976, I think we had a total of about 70 encounters. Almost all of them were with the resident fish eater type. Uh, two or three times a month they were down in Puget Sound and the rest of the time they were pretty much up here in the San Juan's core area. Um, and we noticed that, that they followed runs of salmon. And we weren't too sure what species at the time, but now we know it's Chinook salmon. And we also know that uh, beginning in 1975 through about 1984, basically salmon fishing in, in the Pacific Northwest of North America was a free-for-all. It was like the commercial, the treaty Indian, the sport fisheries. They were catching one and a half to almost two million salmon per year that came through the Strait of Juan de Fuca to the Puget Sound and this area. Huge numbers, and they averaged 17 and a half pounds each. Um, but that, it, it was overfishing. They, they decimated, literally decimated the population of Chinook salmon. And the whale stopped going to Puget Sound, where half a million salmon a year were... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Who dat? <laughs> yeah. Stop okay, up. yeah, I'll just back up. <clears throat> and uh, they stopped going into Puget Sound. Basically, we had been used to seeing them two or three times a month, and then by 1985, they were not going now except in the autumn they'd go in for chum runs because there were no Chinook left in Puget Sound. And now we're seeing pretty much the same thing here. We're looking at, uh, what, 2017? A very poor year for Chinook in the Salish Sea in general, but in, in the core area here where they used to feed almost daily. Um, we've seen them, what, twice, three times this year. It's, uh, they're not going to be here to see us. They're, they're here for salmon to eat. And the salmon are smaller, much less numerous. They're virtually all hatchery fish. In the 1980s, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife had a policy decision to develop sport fisheries, sell licenses, develop the sport fishery, and have factory fish from hatcheries to supply the fish for the fishery. And uh, it's a big business, it's lots of money. There aren't as many fish, but uh, and they aren't as big, but that's, you know, it's a people-oriented thing. They didn't, nobody ever thought about the whales. We began to raise our voice a little bit, but at the time, the killer whales, or the fish-eating uh, southern residents that we were studying, uh, had just gone through a couple of decades of uh, gunfire and shooting because fishermen were they were trying to get rid of the competition. They all carried lead bullets in their bodies, and very rarely did they get killed because they're such big tough animals. But we didn't want to raise the salmon issue in the 80s 
when salmon were already going down uh, and have more whales get shot. But uh, I think it's safe to raise it now. Everybody loves the whales and uh, we know they eat salmon. And so let's solve the salmon problem. Do you have any ideas about how you might solve, solve the problem from here? Well, the salmon problem, uh, ideas for solving the salmon problem. I, I mean, I'm not the first kid on the block to say, hey, there's a problem. Actually, beginning in the late 1800s, when canneries were put up all at every river entrance, over-exploitation of salmon was becoming rather common. Uh, but by the time salmon get to the river, they're what they call, uh, uh, they're not bright, they're not fresh. They've already started the physiological transition to not eating, using up their body fats to continue to run up the river, lay the eggs, uh, spread the sperm, die, fertilize the forests, and so on. Uh, and they're just, their quality is, as far as taste, humans' uh, idea of what tasted like a good salmon. Yeah, it was okay to put in a can and make a mush out of it and sell it around the world. But uh, by the 1930s, uh, this taste for salmon, which was developing worldwide, uh, wanted a fresher fish, a brighter fish. So they started doing the fishing away from the rivers. In fact, they outlawed the river canneries. And they uh, uh, did a more, we call it cowboy, you know, roundup. Go out and catch them all with a net out on the, out on the sea, in this case out in front of my house. And uh, you know, you got them a week before they hit the river and they haven't started to deteriorate yet. So it's a fresher, brighter fish. Um, and that just went gangbusters. But the problem is from the 30s to the 70s really, it was uh, a white man's fishery. There, there weren't many native fishers. The, the people who lived in this region depended upon fish for survival and their food. And there was a landmark case in 1975 where the Supreme Court of the United States said that the treaties we made with these tribes in the 1870s um, guaranteed them a uh, they could fish in common. And he interpreted it meaning you know, we don't have any, you know, 99% of the fishing is done by white men. So we have to have these treaty Indian fisheries develop. And the way we'll do that is uh, we'll let the cowboys fish one day a week and the treaty Indians can fish seven days a week to try and start balancing this thing out. Um, but they didn't say that you couldn't fish every day of the year. And they did fish every day of the year. And cowboys bought Indians to help fish for them and stuff like that. Um, and all the fish were removed from 1975 to 80, 82, 83, 84. By 84, it was clear that there were very few fish left going in the rivers of the Chinook variety that the killer whales were eating. Um, there's still a lot of pinks and a lot of chum and a lot of sockeye salmon, but these are not major diet items and they're only available to the whales for a very short period of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there were a lot of, of uh, pinks and a lot of chum and a lot of sockeye salmon and they all had different life histories they're smaller fish, from the, for one thing. They're, you know, three to seven, eight, nine pounds. Um, and they're only available in their spawning runs, which were maybe 30 days in duration with a typical uh, standard 
curve, you know, in the middle of the migration, you'd have the most fish and a few fish at the beginning and a few at the end. Wasn't enough to feed a whale year round. Whereas Chinook, they spawn in every river. There's sometimes spring runs, uh, early summer runs, midsummer runs, late summer runs, fall runs, and winter runs. So year round there was Chinook until they got fished out. Yeah, I don't know how to solve that problem. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> fishing is obviously, I mean, self destructive. There's no open season now. Uh, but the other destruction is access to the spawning habitat. The dams that have blocked millions of fish from actually reproducing are still in place and they need to be removed or bypassed. Uh, the estuaries where the little fish grow up, they've been industrialized. We've got uh, coal terminals, oil terminals, shipping, marinas, uh, you know, there's no place for the little fish to grow up either. All this stuff has to be kind of reviewed and and uh, focus the efforts toward make it possible for the salmon to live and then the whales can recover. But as long as we're just going along like we're doing this management in half or third or tenth measures, we'll never see the population recover.